All right, so let's get started. Happy Tuesday. So I'm going to send it over to Zach Vaughn and his team so that they can start. And um, all right, Zach, it's on you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Merle. And thank you, everybody, for, uh, for attending this evening. Um, just uh, you know, by way of quick introduction, I think it may just be myself from Vector this evening. I'm, uh, I'm the director of our federal security, security engineering team. I've uh, been with Vectra approaching two years now. Um, I've uh, only, my entire professional IT career, um, have worked with uh, supporting US federal agencies in various capacities as um, a Unix administrator going way, way back, doing identity and access management, uh, Linux administration, um, when uh, virtualization you know, came on the scene, became a virtualization administrator and then architect for a number of agencies. Uh, and then made the shift the, uh, 10, 11 years back uh, to go work for an OEM uh, company named Nutanix. Um, saw them, you know, joined them pre-IPO, took them to uh, public, um, helped build the federal team over there and uh, doing kind of the same thing the last almost two years here at Vectra. So really appreciate everybody taking the time to join. I noticed there was somebody else uh, from Vectra, which is awesome. So I appreciate uh, you being on as well. Um, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes ahead of launching into the Blue Team workshop to give uh, a background on what Vector is, what we're trying to do uh, in the space. Um, we'll touch a little bit about AI and, and the use of AI, how Vector has been using AI for a number of years, even as it has become you know, a, a very, very hot topic. Um, I think for this crowd, it seems like, especially given um, the breadth of uh, enablement that, that Merle was mentioning. I think this crowd has been aware of the, the power of what AI represents, but I mean, I think in the public consciousness, certainly over the last, you know, nine to 12 months, it's, uh, it's really entered to the forefront. Uh, so much to the point that, uh, you know, I guess, jokingly, everybody now has to be an AI company. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about who Vector is, why, why we exist, what it is that we're trying to do. And then we'll pivot from there into a hands-on exercise. Um, you're well, I saw in the chat, um, I'll post all of the information necessary. It's something that you, all you need is a web browser to participate. Um, I've got, there's some reverse proxy credentials that I'll put again, share all of that in the chat. I did pre-create um, 75 different accounts. Uh, they're just numbered sequentially. But they all have the same password. So people are welcome to snag those if you'd like, but honestly, uh, it takes the same amount of time to input those credentials as it will to create a unique account for yourself. And it's there's no tracking or anything that will get emailed to you. In fact, you don't even need to use a, uh, a valid email address to sign up for tonight's evening, uh, uh, this evening's event. So with that, let me um, let me share my screen just for a couple of slides. We won't spend too much time in the slides. And, uh, and then we can pivot from there into the active exercise which I, I will also run through and explain what we're doing um, in the blue team environment. So let me share my screen. And if somebody would be kind enough to just share in the chat, if you can see the screen because PowerPoint and Zoom sometimes. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, maybe if you could do me a favor and just let me know if as the slides advance, we still seeing now we should see an agenda. Sometimes uh, if I'm using this view, it gets, okay, <laughs> good enough. So perfect, thank you all very much, I appreciate it. So, you know, already introduced myself, so that's great. And Merle, thank you again for the opportunity to, to speak to the group. Um, you know, in the, in the context of cybersecurity uh, and in the conversations I have regularly with, with CISOs and um, CTOs, uh, you know, the, just the one constant is that there's more. Um, we have more surfaces to deal with. We're bringing certainly, you know, through the course of the pandemic and even afterwards, uh, we've got more and more remote users, which by that very nature extends the surface of what we need to protect. Um, and then, you know, where, where the users go, so go the attackers. So even as that surface is increasing, uh, so too are the spaces and, and, and soft spots across those different surfaces that attackers are going to probe. Um, I think specifically now around, if we think about identity, um, identity become, has become such a rich target for attackers because given that we're leveraging federated identity services to allow us single sign-on capabilities, 
Um, you know, as we're, we're building hybrid applications, even hybrid enterprise networks that span on-premises and cloud um, regions, you know, single sign-on is a great thing. Um, however, if somebody figures out how to go ahead and snag that OAuth um, token, they've now basically unlocked anywhere that is that you can go. And if they've got nefarious purposes and intent, um, you know, they're going to use every trick in the book. So just, just more and more and more. And I was having a conversation about a year ago with a CISO and, you know, they, we, we were kind of, I was explaining, it was, it was an introductory call and talking about, you know, why Vector, kind of similar to this presentation. And um, they said, you know, look, I like everything that you're saying. He said, but you have to understand too that, there's a feel, there's a real feeling in cybersecurity of like, when, when, when are we, when have we done enough? Not, not to say that we stop, but, you know, initially we go way, way back, you know, it was like, we're going to, we're going to thicken our perimeter and we're going to harden the perimeter. Um, and, uh, and that's not enough, obviously, like the attacker still found a way in, um, you know, we introduced things like multi-factor authentication, um, which again, you know, in the theme of more, I'm doing more and more and more to try and secure, uh, you know, my, my networks, my enterprise, my business, et cetera. Um, you know, so we, we, bought, we, we put in multi-factor authentication. Um, you know, we needed to send all of the logs, even as we're instantiating more and more of these systems, we had to have a place to store all the information that they were generating and, and ideally correlate it. So we introduced STEM and, and uh, you know, and then, we're, you know, there's, there's executive orders and mandates that come out that, that say you need to have, EDR solutions. And, and so we, we did that. And he's like, so when <laughs> there's definitely a feeling of fatigue is like, even as we're trying to do all of these things and maintain expertise in all these different realms, um, we're never, he goes, I, he's like, it's some, it's a semi rhetorical question because the answer is, you know, it, it's a never ending race, right? Even as we, as defenders are putting up newer roadblocks or, or traps to uh, to try and stall and, and ferret out these attackers. The reality is a motivated nation state is willing to burn millions and millions of dollars uh, to create campaigns of immense distraction to ultimately go after whatever it is that they seek to get their hands on. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about, you know, things like, you know, zero trust architecture, et cetera. Um, suffice to say that, that you know, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that even, um, even as, this problem of more um, is is kind of ever pervasive. Um, there are there are there are efforts being taken to try and mitigate some of the threats that are represented, you know, in this ever changing landscape. So, I think yeah, I was I've, I've been at the the show floor at Gartner uh, up at the the Gaylord there in the National Harbor the last two days. Uh, I'll be back again tomorrow, but um, having a conversation with someone at our engagement zone and. And they said, well, so you're doing, you know, security-led AI. Um, is the intent there to replace the, the human analyst? And I said, well, uh, respectfully, we are already at a deficit from cyber defenders. So no, I'm not trying to replace any person. I'm trying to uh, ideally augment those individuals that are, are willing to do this incredibly complex task, um, up-level them, make their jobs and, and frankly, their lives easier um, because the burnout experienced in this industry is a very, very real thing, um, you know, again, in the more. Um, you know, even as uh, we've, we've, we've created these different types of systems to try and triage and respond to emerging threats, um, you know, as I mentioned before, motivated attackers are going to find a way inside. And, you know, with an, uh, an average dwell time of approaching an entire calendar year in some cases, um, you know, th it's just kind of untenable. And, and you know, again, back, get back to that motivated nation state, um, you know, these are entities in which time is on their side. Um, and in fact, the cyclical nature of the rotating staffing of SOCs um, just plays again in their favor. Um, they can choose to do a single type of activity that, you know, lacking any additional context, just gets lost in a sea of noise of alerts, you know, that, that any, any reasonable human being would sit there and say, well, that's, if they even see it, they'll say it's different. Uh, but, you know, are they going to remember and write down a log that, you know, back two and a half weeks ago, they saw something that was unusual, but nothing nefarious um, or, or in and of itself bad. Um, and then, you know, their shifts turn over, maybe they go on vacation, 
um, you know, how do they start to stitch together that campaign of something that's truly low and slow that takes and escalates over months to even approaching years sometimes. Um, you know, we're, as humans, we, we're, we're bound by the limits of human memory and endurance. Um, attackers, you know, they get to sit there and execute a script, um, you know, probe around a little bit, go dark again. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really asymmetric in, in, in its design and the relationship between us. And so enter, enter why Vectra and, and why Vectra AI. And, and, you know, I did, I kind of alluded to people using AI pretty frequently these days to describe what, you know, in some form or fashion, whatever it is that they, they espouse that they do. Um, we are, we've been in the business of doing security led AI uh, for the last 11 years. Um, the first five to six of those really built in or spent doing deep research and development in crafting the bespoke methods, uh, partnering security researchers with top of field data scientists, PhDs who understand how to craft the appropriate types of algorithms that map back not to a specific, um, call it, um, you know, payload or, or, or um, you know, previously known CVE or anything like that that an attacker may use, but really looking, you know, using the, the MITRE attack framework as, as the backstop for the approach. What are the, you know, if we look at the phases of the cyber kill chain, what are things that once attackers find their way post compromise into an environment, what do they have to do? You know, performing reconnaissance, um, escalating privilege, moving laterally, exfiltrating data, the, the, the interstitial steps. Um, so we're gonna get into, you know, what Vector has built to really, you know, back to the, the example I gave of, of up-leveling and arming the analyst um, as they're trying to, to, to fight this asymmetric battle. Um, just one brief, Blackstone uh, is, is both an investor and a customer of Vectra. Um, you know, the type of efficiency that they've seen gained by just Camping down on the amount of noisiness thrown at their analysts um, and how much more effective they've been able to be in truly tracking down um, indicators that matter within their environment and, and also how much more quickly they're able to triage out benign indicators. So, you know, the, the, the false positives, if you will. Um, if, if you can throw fewer of those at somebody, if they're able to react and respond that much more quickly, the signal that's left. Um, is, is typically that much more important to have front and center in front of the analyst. Um, so I've already kind of segued into talking about Vector, but as I mentioned, um, you know, founded in, in 2011, um, we have over 100 models now um, leveraging things like supervised and unsupervised learning methods. Um, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit more about the AI. There's, there's a, a far deeper discussion to be had um, for those that are interested around the data science behind what it is that Vector is doing. Um, and in fact, if um, if you happen to have the opportunity um, or the desire to speak to the data scientists that have helped to build these models, um, I've put them in front of uh, various data science teams within the intelligence community. And while I, again, I am by no means a data scientist, um, but it's very validating to me to see the level of recognition. In some cases, we've had the data science team tell us after the fact, you know, that was a truly worthwhile conversation that took place because oftentimes when people say, oh, well, we'll bring our data scientists in, they're not the type of data scientists that, uh, that these folks are used to speaking with. Um, I mentioned the, the, the mapping to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. We also co-developed uh, uh, a number of countermeasures in the MITRE DEFEND framework. Uh, we, have over, uh, we have 12 uh, patents around uh, the AI methods uh, around those countermeasures. Um, and, you know, for those that are interested in the, this type of thing, you know, from a, a pre-IPO uh, company, um, just crossed the $100 million annual recurring revenue mark uh, at the end of last year. Um, and, you know, as, as we go forward, as the market uh, makes sense, uh, I think ultimately the idea will be to, uh, to take the company public. Um, I, I mentioned a little bit about my background, um, having been here at Vector just shy of two years, we already had a, a decent representation of federal agencies using Vectra. Um, we are most deeply deployed uh, across a number of intelligence agencies, uh, as well as Department of Defense agencies. We have uh, 
IATTs and ATOs on several DOD networks. Um, we're also deployed at a number of civilian agencies, as you can see by some of the logos here, to include um, the Drug Enforcement Administration. We're used by the U.S. Senate, um, the U.S. House of Representatives, and the Library of Congress, the, uh, the Capitol Hill tri triumvirate, if you will, um, Department of Energy headquarters, and a number of others. Um, so uh, we're, a, we're a small, I'm, let's see, I lead a team of five people. Uh, I regularly um, go and, and give you know, initial presentations around what Vector is. I'll do installations, I'll do uh, triage, I'll give demos, um, but I'm very fortunate to work with a team of highly motivated uh, engineer, engineers. And um, all but one of us are cleared to varying degrees. Um, and then we have the same, uh, a comparable number of uh, sales managers focused on the different verticals within federal, uh, and we're spread out across the, the United States. I'm based uh, out of Washington, D.C., so I'm, I'm a local for anybody in the, the Northern Virginia area, uh, as well as a number of our, our, our other team members. Um, when it comes to integrating the, the signal that Vector provides, we're not trying to uh, you know, be the, we, we don't have any notion that, you know, we're the one tool that's going to solve anybody's problems. Um, I, I, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm very proud of the work that our data science and security researching teams have done in, in providing a really easy to use and understand product um, that, that really does prioritize what matters for cyber defenders. But at the same time, we're a signal provider um, that is going to work in correlation and contextually with other uh, telemetry that you're gathering, as well as, you know, uh, solutions that can respond based off of the information that Vector is providing, along with that other telemetry, to actually, you know, take action against something that you observe to be um, incorrect within the, the network. I see a comment in the chat, IT glue. Um, I, I don't know that, that we're IT glue, other than the fact that we look at the, net, you know, we're spanning visibility across the network. Um, we've incorporated the ability to look at activities in M365 and Azure AD tenants. And, you know, I mentioned before, I think, I think actually uh, identity is the IT glue now, because that's what everybody is using to move across all of these disparate surfaces. Um, but um, you know, providing unified visibility across these different surfaces, and then again, partnering through um, these and more of the Technology Alliance partners. Um, to ultimately, as I said, provide what I call attack signal intelligence. And, and just high level how we do this, um, I'll start at the network layer, and then we can layer in a couple of additional surfaces that I was mentioning. Um, we passively grab network traffic. Uh, through a span tap or packet broker, and we feed that network traffic to what we call a sensor. Uh, that sensor takes the network traffic and just sends the metadata, um, so not the entire packet, uh, onto the, the vector brain. And the brain houses all of the algorithms that I mentioned. Um, just as an aside, you know, the sensor and the brain can be either virtual machines, physical appliances, depending on the amount of throughput, and those can reside on premises in clouds to include GovCloud regions. Um, you can have a, a many sensor to single brain type of deployment uh, that spans all these different surfaces, grabbing that network telemetry. And then um, we can enrich that information through the integration of various network artifacts by plugging in things like Active Directory, um, Windows event and security logs. We can take information from the SIM if it happens to hold other networking information that we not, may not have visibility to, um, and a host of other integrations, as well as uh, EDR solutions. Um, and then I mentioned the identity and SaaS capabilities. So we can also ingest the, the logging information from M365 and Azure AD tenants to include GCC High uh, for those that, that work with the federal government, uh, specifically, you know, typically DOD. Um, so, different type of uh, tenant that they have in, in the M365 environment. But um, ingesting those logs and processing them to uncover um, housed within the logs actions that may be indicative of compromised identity or, or, or you know, steps that we've seen attackers take once they've grabbed um, you know, those, those OAuth tokens and things of that nature to basically bypass things like MFA and, and start to uh, do nefarious things in people's networks, both on-premises and, you know, on the back end in the cloud. And then 
about a year ago, we released the ability to do a similar auditing capability of AWS as a platform uh, by investing cloud trail logs. So expanded yet again that catalog of models that's really crunching all of this information and surfacing the attack signal intelligence. And we can then backport from the brain not only the detection data, but all of that metadata that we had streamed to the brain and enriched through the, the AI and ML processing, we can output that in a Brozeek format to send it into, you know, a SIM or SOAR data lake. Um, and then again, you know, stitching this together into um, some type of response platform to, to take action based off the information we're providing. Um, you know, I think what, um, as, as I mentioned, we have over, over 150 different models, you know, that span these different surfaces. Um, the metadata, I, I, I kind of like to think of it as the detection data, and that's what we're going to look at primarily through the Blue Team Workshop this evening, is follow, uh, we're, we're basically all going to join a response team leveraging Vectra to look at the progression of an attack. Um, I will say um, the, the, the environment, because this is a big group, uh, we're actually using kind of a, a more guided version of the tool, um, but I'll, I've got in the text of the presentation that will go out, um, anybody's welcome to actually go and, and sign up for a, a self-driven, you know, fully featured demo of the product um, and or um, perfectly happy to set up time where we've got you full access to, to the entirety of the environment to include doing kind of a basically a, either a red team or blue team or purple team type of experience where you have vulnerable infrastructure attacking infrastructure and, and you're seeing the types of uh, detections that Vector generates based off the, the attacks that you perform in the environment. So I think uh, hopefully this is kind of jiving with what I had mentioned before about how we're mapping to the different phases, the different techniques that attackers are using, and that we've got comparable detection capabilities and countermeasures within the tool. Um, you know, at the end of the day, even you know, I started the presentation talking about the more, 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 what we're trying to do as Vectra is really uh, close that aperture down and focus the attention, despite the fact that we may be monitoring, you know, hundreds of thousands of systems, how can we direct that data um, and get what's what's meaningful in front of the analysts? So shrinking down in this case, you know, to 356 of those of those hosts with uh, detections that may need review, but even then scoring it further to really saying, okay, you know, of those 356, well, five of them we're flagging as critical that need your immediate attention. But at the same time, you know, for further incident uh, response and analysis having all of that Zeek formatted metadata on the back end to sift through. And I'll, I'll pivot from our blue team exercise, depending on where we land time-wise. And I'll jump in to uh, a more fully featured demo uh, environment that's gonna actually allow us to dig into some of that metadata, just to give you an example of the type of visibility that we can get. Um, so we're, we're nearing the end of the slides. I mentioned, you know, AI, it's, <laughs> it's all the rage. I think I said hybrid cloud and so, um, Trying to think of what else you need for buzzword bingo at this point, but I think if you say AI and hybrid cloud, you're you're pretty well on your way. Um, I think you know even as everybody's claiming to be an AI company, um, what you do with the type one, the type of input that you're grabbing, and then the type of signal that you output are equally important. So for those that have uh, played around with things like stable diffusion, uh, basically a text to image generator, this is something I, I ran on uh, one of my home systems. You know, I give it a very broad prompt. Uh, hacker in a data center, and you can copy and paste uh, those steps and, you know, the the model that I use to actually generate it, the seed and everything, and you'll get the same output, which which is pretty good. But uh, except that, you know, basically it looks like a lost Best Buy employee sort of feeling their way around the data center, maybe. Um, whereas if I start to get more uh, intentful in the information that I'm providing the, the algorithm and telling it, you know, I want you to focus more on these types of images and I want you to de-emphasize in the negative prompt, you know, these types of images, suddenly I have something that, you know, it, is it, is it great art? No, but is it, you know, at least, you know, kind of clip art or the, or sorry, clip art worthy for a presentation about AI and ML, um, gave it to cyber command and they, they got a kick out of it. Um, so I've talked a little bit about our approach, and I think a lot of people fall into this top bucket, which is 
they take a math led approach, which is really good at finding what's different within an environment. The problem then is you have to start to create very specific rule sets to whittle away at the edges uh, and find the bad within that different, which leads to hundreds of statistical rules. And at the end of the day, it's, it's almost like, you know, a generalized approach will output a generalized result. Um, I mentioned before, our approach is that we're, we're partnering at the hip security researchers who understand these attacker methods, partnering with their data science uh, co-workers to then, you know, look at what I call archetypal attacker behaviors that they're going to have to take. And so we kind of invert um, the above model and we start with what's bad, and then we try to minimize the different that we put in front of you. Um, essentially, if, if you're familiar with the, uh, the idea of the no free lunch theorem, um, we're espousing you, you cannot create a general purpose set of algorithms that you're going to interrogate all of this different information with and get a highly efficacious signal. Um, you know, I, I hate to be reductive, but it's almost more of a, a garbage in, garbage out kind of a thing. And, and, and in that anomaly based type of detection, you're ultimately still flooding an analyst with tons and tons of benign indicators and false positives. And so at the end of the day, you know, I'd say, you know, have you really made their lives any better? Um, you know, we're, we're trying to provide that attack signal intelligence to give greater coverage, clarity, and control, even um, as we're, you know, we're, we're being responsible for protecting more and more and more. Um, I mentioned the, the MITRE approach. And so, you know, we, we feel very I don't know, we feel, we feel very strongly about having a common nomenclature to kind of hang all of this back on so that, you know, it's an understood framework. Um, and we still participate really closely with MITRE. Um, our federal principal technologist, Robert Marcou, and one of the members of our office of the CTO recently co-authored a soon to be published paper on a new MITRE uh, framework called Caveat, which is essentially uh, the attack and defend approach uh, to cloud. So we're, uh, you know, we're coming to the end of the slides and then we're going to jump into the blue team, but just, I just really wanted to drive home the fact that, you know, we we're thinking like attack, that we're, we're working backwards on the problem statement, thinking like an attacker to then show the analyst where it is that they need to direct their attention. And I mean, this is just a subset of the different types of detections that we have in our catalog mapped to the different surfaces. So we're talking about network and identity, um, you know, federated identity through Azure AD and the various public cloud and SaaS platforms. And we have AWS today, Azure's coming later this year. Um, so last slide, and we're gonna move into the blue team workshop. Um, my ask, I guess, would be like, if you take nothing else away from what I said, um, these four things, you know, we are a true AI and ML, we're a data science company that is uh, insanely focused on security and that's it. Um, we're not trying to be everything to everyone, but that is our true north. Um, I, I saw in the chat, there's a request for slides. I will send these slides on uh, so that they are disseminated to the group. Um, up until March of this year, um, we were signatureless. Um, so in fact, one of the customers that I have in Virginia, um, you know, it's, a, it's an alphabet agency. Um, when they deployed an instrumented Vectra, they actually retired their Suricata based uh, signature capability because they said, you know, we actually get better signal from the behavioral based detections that Vectra provides. Um, and so they retired it and they're, they, they fall within a space that uh, they get to make their own rules. Um, a lot of our other customers, even as we have conversations with them and, and their customers of Vectra, where the behavioral based approach is, is the one that they want to take, they have requirements to field solutions that can load signatures. So um, just a couple of months ago, at the end of March of uh, this year, we released the ability that if, if you think back to that diagram that I showed, uh, for people to run a Suricata engine on the same vector sensors that they've already deployed or deploy. Um, and now we're actually doing pattern matching of the traffic. So for known vulnerabilities, they can load um, you know, their, their threat feeds basically onto the engine uh, on that sensor and any matches will hit to a backend SIM. Um, we're agentless, so we're not like, um, you know, NDR is sitting there looking at the network and it's really hard to make an entire network lie um, as opposed to other solutions that have agents and things that can either be bypassed or outright turned off. Uh, and lastly, decryptionless. Um, there are some people that will tell you the only way you can get the type of uh, signal that we espouse to be able to provide is you have to do break and inspect on the traffic. Um, we don't. Uh, we believe that you encrypted that traffic for a reason, and we're not going to create, uh, you know, a data spillage issue or a data cleanup uh, after the fact because you had to break and inspect something. Now you have to do something with the data that you created. So with that, 
I'm going to give the details. I will copy and paste all of this information into the chat. Um, oh, whoops. Sorry, I've got it on a, uh, on a notepad here. Uh, yes, I have heard of Versic. Um, they are not a, uh, I would say they, they provide complementary capabilities. Uh, I don't, I don't view them as a, uh, as a competitor. So for those that would like to follow along in real time, um, this will be the URL. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, that's great. Again, I'm, I, I, so I, I'm a big believer in defense and depth strategy. You know, you saw the the slide um, in terms of partnership. Um, I've got friends who work at a number of different <laughs> companies, and in, you know, in some cases we partnered up, in some cases we compete, and that's just kind of the 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 nature of uh, of the business. So when you go to that URL, um, you will be prompted with a reverse proxy, uh, not challenge, but but uh, text box input. Everybody will use the same you know, username here, which is a pretty long, you know, Vectra underscore 16860127877. And then this is the same password. Um, it will then, in fact, let me, let, me, um, let me do one last thing and then I'll pivot over and I will load that same page as I'm taking you through uh, the blue team workshop. So please don't feel as though, I mean, for anybody that wants to do this in real time as we're doing it together, I love it. I think that's great. Um, I'm going to take you through all the stages of the blue team workshop and talk through what, what it is that we're doing. And like I said, I'm at the other end. I'll even pivot into a different demo environment, uh, time permitting, that will actually look at some of that metadata analysis in more detail. Um, this environment can be made available to any of you all at any time. So if you, you know, I know it's late in the day, if you prefer to sit back and, and kind of just observe, awesome. If you want to, you know, get your hands on this, yeah, let's do this together. I did mention um, it's on the screen there. This is a more guided, what do I say, guided journey through this blue team workshop, um, meaning uh, th there are certain portions of the UI that, that we've actually disabled because we're trying to keep people on a specific path. Having said that, you know, if you would like um, to access the, the broader demo, which is also on that slide, you can sign yourself up at any given time. It has guidance to take you through a couple different narratives, but you can step outside of those boundaries and actually click through the entire live environment in that um, in that broader demo in the same environment that I'll, I'll pivot into uh, time permitting the end of this. So I did create, for those that have logged in, and you'll see it here in a moment when I, um, when I jump over to it, um, you'll be prompted to either log in or register an account. And again, the registration for the account for the purposes of this event you can make up a username. It doesn't have to be attributable back to you. Uh, it will prompt you for an email address. It doesn't check to see if the email address is valid and it will ask you to create a password. Um, and it can be you know, pretty, pretty simple type of password. Um, or you can use anything between these two accounts that I'm going to share here. So dn underscore 01 at dnmup.com. Um, is that a, an L? Uh, so there's no L's, um, oh wait, oh, in the, um, that is an L, I believe in the password, um, for the reverse proxy credentials. I'll find out here in, in just a second. Um, do, so we have dn underscore zero one at dnmeetup.com all the way sequentially through d dn underscore 75 at dnmup.com. Uh, password is exactly the same, uppercase v vector 1234 bang. Um, so those are pre-created. My ask would just be, if you grab one of those pre-created ones, if you would just for your neighbors, um, mention, you know, hey, I'm, I'm dn01, I'm dn02, et cetera, just so people can, you know, kind of iterate down through the list, um, if, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna stop sharing this and I will pivot over to the blue team. Is my uh, let's see. I don't want to share multiple windows. No, that is not it. Not that share. One moment. Oh, it's on the same window as uh, Zoom that loaded. So. 
Um, and like I said, you know, welcome to grab those those pre created uh, accounts, but feel free to to add. Um, to add. Okay. Oh wait, that's this is still not the screen. Apologies. Too many windows. Close that. Close that. And here we go. Okay, and I've, I've, I've been following in the chat. I see a number of people who are, who are saying that they're in. So, you know, feel free to, it is, it is self-guided. Um, I, I know with a, with a group this large and with the request to kind of stay on mute, it, um, you know, feel free to, you know, if you have problems, um, you know, post them in the chat. Um, there are some tricks, um, but ultimately there's also a hint system that you'll see so I'll create a user for myself. Uh, um, and, and basically, we're going to, th there'll be an additional tab that gets opened up that'll actually take us into that vector console that I had mentioned. Um, so I'm trying to just arrange my windows. So basically, um, this this may be this may ring more true to life than is uh, is, is comfortable for some. Um, this may be the reality in which you live. Um, but basically, you're woken at three a.m. and your 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 phone is ringing, um, and there's been a major data breach, and there's been in this case just under half a gig of data leaked onto a public site. So your CISO wants you to run through what has gone on to understand the breadth of the incident, and you know obviously from a root cause analysis, how did it happen? Um, the data that was leaked was post, uh, posted on corporateleaks.com, and you've only got an hour to basically get this debrief in front of the CISO uh, because she wants answers and she wants them now. Um, so we're going to use the Vectra platform to investigate the network to understand what has taken place within the environment. And the way in which the, the exercise is structured, it's, it's looking for specific responses. And then when you complete the initial challenge, you close it out. And it, it, it prompts you for, uh, you know, kind of the next set of information that, that you're looking for. So moving on to the initial investigation, let's find out who actually did this. Um, so, so you're, you know, you're powering down a bunch of coffee to get your mind uh, sharp as you're sitting there, you know, rubbing sleep out of your eyes. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is open the Vectra Detect tool. And you should see it drop you right into uh, a view like this. Um, this is our dashboard. Just as a highlight, I mean, we're looking at a very modest, um, you know, 20 concurrent systems being monitored here. But even of those 20, we're really only showing three hosts that require any kind of attention. And of those three, only two of them in that critical quadrant. So let me go back to the challenge here. Um, it says, did you notice the new host pop up in the critical quadrant? So let's start by looking at this prioritized host. Um, First, we need to find out whether or not this host was, you know, participating in the data leak that had occurred. So, going back to this, if I go into the hosts, and I notice that this HFLAX system was in here, and yeah, it's it's being tagged as a critical asset, um, and based off of everything that we're seeing taking place, and we're the the default view is that it 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 builds the narrative of the successive actions that have taken place associated with these hosts um, by virtue of seeing the first at the bottom. Um, under normal circumstances, if we were in a more live environment, you could actually sort by first scene and put you know, the first thing that happened at the top. In this case, we're working our way up from the bottom and we see that there is an indicator of command and control uh, indicative of external remote access. So, um, what we want to do in this case is look at the traffic to that domain. So click on the drop down in the exfil category to see any indication of the attack. And we want to know in for the challenge of this, you know, what was the uh, what was the name of the host uh, that was part uh, potentially participating in this? And so if we say 
H flex. We, we know there's there's details now. Um, now you may have seen in, in some of the details that we were populating associated with that command and control detection. Um, I, I mentioned the way in which we're instrumented, Vextra is instrumented in a number of federal agencies. You know, we're, we're taking all of those, th those informational artifacts and we're sending them either into ticketing systems or in some cases, depending on the criticality of the asset, you know, basically immediately entering into a remediation workflow via a SOAR platform or something like that. Um, but, you know, I think oftentimes marrying up or, or layering the detection information, as can be seen, you know, in terms of like the targets, the external hosts, the number of sessions, et cetera, um, but then layering that over top of all of the observed metadata. Um, and actually, I apologize. Um, looking at the top here, we're looking at this host and, and you, you see that it's been assigned a threat and a certainty score. Um, the threat score, both of these are a combination of all of the scoring of the observed successive behaviors. Uh, how do you get back to the challenge page? Uh, it should have opened a new tab. If it didn't, you can just hold back on your browser button or just reload the URL uh, for the blue team workshop and choose to log in as the account that you're using. Um, and it will take you to whatever phase you are through the attack. Um, and I would just, um, if it didn't by default open a new tab, I would, um, when you're on this initial investigation and it talks about, let's start by logging of extra, um, just right click and open your link in a new tab. That's what, that's what I'm doing here. I'm pivoting back and forth between um, the cyber range scorecard with the challenges tab and the, the vector UI uh, or the, the guided version of the vector UI. So you could jump back into the command and control challenge. Um, so we see in this case, that we're communicating with an external host uh, and we're in the command and control phase. Um, so, uh, sorry, I, and I was just describing the, uh, the threat and certainty uh, assigned to the host. So that's comprised of all of the observed detections that we are associated with that host, um, the, the, the successive nature of them. So if you'll notice where we are, you know, in terms of this host experiencing the attack phases, um, we've gone all the way, in this case, unfortunately, in this example, you know, all the way out to exfiltration of data. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that through through the, the steps in the exercise. But um, you, you can see that each one of the detections themselves has a threat and certainty score. And so if I click on this external remote access, I can see the external host IP with which we're communicating. Um, if I click on that question mark associated with any of the different types of detections, you can see the variance in the scoring, both around threat and certainty. Threat basically asserting that if what we're saying is actually happening, the potential harm that this could represent to your network or organization. Um, certainty builds over time in terms of the confidence of the system. And that's really influenced by the types of detections observed uh, relative to any other um, similar detections or associated detections either on that particular host or account or seen acting in concert with other resources within the environment. And then we're, we're providing all of the MITRE ATT&CK key codes that map to this particular type of detection because we, you know, we're calling this particular detection external remote access. Um, there, there, there are you know, MITRE specific terms. We're not using the MITRE specific terms, but we wanna make sure that people understand hey, these map back to these indicators that MITRE provides, as well as explaining you know, how it was that we came to assert that this was happening within the environment, possible root causes for this, um, the business impact, and then ways that you can look outside of the tool. Um, to go and verify that this is actually happening within your account. Um, so we have the external IP of the, the, the host of the external IP uh, of the external system. Uh, one one kind of tip that I'll give to you, you may have seen it when you first logged into, um, or actually for, so, for those of you using the existing accounts, you may not have seen the tip. Um, using the back button because of the way in which this environment is constructed, like I said, there's, there's a lot of rails that are kind of put on place. Um, it can sometimes break some of those flows, but you can always click on the host itself to be taken back to that list of detections. So in this case, we were looking for the IP address of that external system that we're communicating with. We'll paste that into the channel. And so then we can, we can move on to gathering some threat intelligence. 
so um, so actually, we, we can actually notice that our we have the ability to ingest threat intelligence feeds. We have a vector provided one, and then you're also welcome to load your own. Um, and in this case, uh, we're actually flagging because we have that in, uh, instrumented in this environment. Um, so if we go and look at what information our threat intelligence feed is associating with this external domain, we can get a little bit more information about what they're doing. And up here in the attacker details, we're saying that this is likely indicative of a cobalt strike attack. So if we copy, I can copy cobalt strike, and then we're inputting that here. Um, I will, uh, just as a heads up, there are a few of these challenges as we get a little further in, into the, the flow that I'm not gonna say that they're, they're not trick questions, but they are very, they're crafted in a way that they are expecting very specific answers. Um, so not to worry, even um, in some cases, uh, just cause it's been a long day for me, I, I might actually go with my gut and pick the wrong thing, but we'll work our way backwards through it to ultimately get to the right answers. So here, you know, we're actually looking for uh, multiple answers where we're gonna provide comma separated with space in between values. So um, we need to look at the other detections, you know, I, even though this is a, a, a we, we basically determined that this is the host that was involved in the attack, but there's a number of steps that occurred, um, you know, beginning with that external remote access. And then once they've gained entry into the environment, not surprisingly, the attackers needed to find out and probe around them to see, you know, kind of get the lay of the land and then basically look for, you know, um, softer targets for, you know, accounts with escalated privilege that are going to allow them to uh, escalate that privilege and start to move laterally within the environment, do some additional recon, and then ultimately grab the data that they, they came in to get. So this is asking us, um, look at the other detections on the host and see if you can find out more. The lateral and recon phase, um, basically saying that they're, you know, trying to perform reconnaissance. Um, what detections do you see under the recon phase excluding file share enumeration detection? So if we go back here and we look at everything uh, around the recon phase, we can see that we're looking for, they're, they're performing port sweep. Let's see. Suspicious LDAP query. That'll be fun to type in front of a bunch of people. Um, file share enumeration. Oh, wait, sorry, not including file share enumeration. So the reconnaissance port sweep, uh, suspicious LDAP query, and then I missed the RPC reconnaissance in between there. So RPC recon. And we are not to include the file share enumeration. So that should work. I'll take that trailing comma out. Good. So let's find out, you know, as they were probing um, the surrounding network, what, uh, you know, what port and service did the attackers attempt a port sweep on? And we can answer with either the port number or the service name, excuse me. So if we go and look at the port sweep, we can actually see right there the, uh, the, the port that we're using. And, and just as, as an aside, again, you know, for each one of these detections, and, and if you click on the download all, it's a, I want to say it's a 147 page document that has all of these different mappings for, for the full catalog of detections uh, that Vector provides. So we're looking at uh, port 445. Good. And now, um, so they've done their port sweep and now it's, it's not unusual for attackers to just kind of blast out RPC calls, um, just to see what they can do, um, on the surrounding infrastructure. So we need to total up the total calls and how many UUIDs, um, did they use to execute this reconnaissance? And we're going to format our response in 
the number of calls, comma, space, the number of UUIDs. So let's pivot back to the host. Let's go take a look at the RPC reconnaissance in detail. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to minimize part of Zoom here. Um, so here's here's one of those things, uh, and, there, and there's quite a bit of information, so I actually have to scroll here. Um, so kind of need to let me make sure that I'm remembering exactly what it is that we're, we're being asked for. So we want to know both the number of UUIDs um, and then also the total number of calls um, represented by those UUIDs. So this first UUID we know is the, the SAMR one, and that made 2,950 calls. So SAMR is one. We made 2,950. If I scroll down, oh wait, you know what? Okay, I wanted to make sure this wasn't a trick question where it was like, oh, give me the UUID with the largest number of calls made. So, uh, SRV uh, SVC is the second UUID. SRV, and I'm just jotting notes in my notebook, kind of like I would be doing if I was actually analyzing the environment and taking some of this information down or copying pasting it into a notepad. SRV SVC uh, with 1,920 calls. Uh, WKS SVC, our third UUID SVC, and that made 975 calls. And then the Windows Registry Service, service uh, 300 calls. So. Uh, by my count, we've got four UUIDs, and then I am not, not, not only am I not a data scientist, I am so bad at math, I have to use a calculator for doing basic arithmetic. So 2,950 plus 1,920 plus 975 plus 300. I'm sure there are many of you who did all that in your head and are uh, you know, putting me to shame right now. Uh, so I have four UUIDs. And I don't have to put a space, uh, but I do need to rem remove that uh, that comma there. So uh, 6,145 calls. And I, my total call, oh, I reversed it. Let's see. There we go. So apologies again, um, talking. It, I guess it, I'm making excuses, but talking uh, to attendees of the, the Gartner conference, uh, two days straight. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little frayed around the edges, but I uh, appreciate everybody's patience and those that are working along with me. Um, so the next challenge, which RPC call was most prevalent, had the highest number of targets in the activity observed? Uh, so the highest number of targets. So different than the number of calls, let's go back and investigate the targets. So SAMR had 20 targets. Uh, SRV, SVC had 15 targets, uh, WKS, SVC had 11 targets, and the Windows Registry Service had three targets. So that first UUID, SM, SAMR, I believe will be the correct UUID that we want to identify in this case. So, you know, we're, we're, we're honing in on what, again, this is, this is an after the fact scenario, ideally, um, let me just pivot back to the host. Um, ideally, if you have, you know, if you, if you were to have Vectra instrumented within your environment, I, I was talking to a backup vendor at the show today, and they were asking, "Oh, do you have API integration?" I said, "Yeah, abs you know, absolutely." And I said, "Well, what what do you all do, you know, around ransomware? Can you stop ransomware?" And I said, "Well, you know, we're we're going to provide the signal, but if I were partnered with um, a backup and recovery solution." If I had, you know, based off the, the previously observed detections, kind of working my way up to seeing a file share enumeration take place within my environment, um, that may be a case where I would want to either autom semi-automate or fully automate some kind of outreach to my backup system, one, to maybe, you know, move and create yet another copy of the last known good backups to depending on you know the potential severity of the situation um perhaps even isolating uh network isolating that known good copy because um ransomware attackers now not only are they go they're looking to encrypt 
um, the, the live systems themselves, but they're specifically targeting backups because they know that, you know, that's kind of the first fallback measure is to, you know, I'm going to go back and go to my last known good copy. Um, so just some, something to think about in terms of how, how you could instrument these things. Um, so let's see. So we can also see that the system detected our host making suspicious LDAP queries um, compared to its normal behavior. Um, so something, you know, definitely something suspicious going on on the host. So we're going to review the suspicious LDAP query. Um, and we're going to look for the host name or IP address as captured by the platform and the number of objects received. And then we're going to put that into a value, comma, space, the other value. So either IP address or host name. Um, and how many objects were received in the response query? So this is just an LDAP query. We can see the IP address of that LDAP server. I'm going to copy that. And the number of objects, we can see the type of requ LDAP requests being made. Um, and, and those of you who have been looking at my screen may have noticed. Um, this other tab that I have open up here, and you may even be familiar with uh, the topic uh, that is being presented by that tab, but we'll move into that in, in a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to show it as an example here. But so 216 objects received. Um, how many objects were received in response? 216. Good. So following on from that, so how many distinct FAM account types can we observe in the LDAP query? So uh, one thing to note, and, and, and by the way, you know, I, I'm, like I said, I, I may end up having to avail myself to the hints, um, hopefully not, but um, you know, if you're working along at your own pace, you know, feel free to, to click on those unlocks. Um, there is a score attached, by the way, the score has no reflection on the continuing education credits. You know, that's, that's I, I believe you're, you're, you're given that just by virtue of us spending the time together here this evening. Um, but but you know you know if you're if you're kind of one of those uh, you know compete against your own best score types, um, you can try and 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 solve these things without availing yourself to the hints. But uh, the structure works basically. The first unlock um, kind of gives you a nudge more in the right direction, and then the, that second unlock, which costs a, a higher number of points, um, it it does give you the answer. Uh, so how many distinct SAM account types can be observed in the LDAP query? Um, so let me pivot back over to here. And if you click into this, we can actually see this really long list. And this is one of those cases where um, I'm not gonna do it in real time, but if you copy and paste this all out or, or you know, kind of start to basically copy and paste each one of these SAM account types with the unique identifier, um, there are duplicates in here. So it, it's not a matter of, uh, uh, because it's asking specifically how many unique ones are we finding? So uh, ending in 457, ending in 456, ending in 912, ending in 369. There's that 57. There's the 368. So we're up to four by my count. Um, 912 is a duplicate. Uh, 913, so we're up to five. And now 256 is a duplicate, 257, we already saw um, 912. Um, so I believe the correct answer, if you dedupe all of the different ones there to find the unique value should be six. And so the reason that I had the, um, this other tab up here real quick, uh, which is the code for you know bloodhound ad slash sharpound three. Um, if we start to did my find show up here? Yeah. So if I start to search for these spam account types here in this code, which um, you, you'll notice that that these are actually so they they were most likely running you know some some version of of bloodhound ad. Uh, in this instance to go and look for the different account types. Um, so you can you can read more about uh, the Bloodhound tool if it's if it's not something that you're familiar with, but it's a really powerful tool that, that is used frankly by both attackers and defenders uh, alike. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's out there now to, to basically be able to 
find Bloodhound and Sharphound. But, um, you know, we're not, the, the way in which Vector is detecting that, it has nothing to do, there's nothing inherent in the Vectra capability that, that sits there and says, oh, I identified those same account types. I'm telling you it's a, it's Bloodhound or Sharphound. Um, but if you were to, you know, query the backend metadata or something like that, um, you, you would most likely kind of come to that, that conclusion on your own. Um, so we, we entered six. Now we're starting to look at the lateral movement that's going to take place. Um, and in fact, sorry, I, I guess I, uh, I buried the lead a little bit there. I, I forgot that we actually talk about the fact that they likely used a tool like Sharpound uh, to map out the domain. Um, the user account associated with this host normally uh, doesn't have the privilege to access the leak files. So they basically comp compromised another account um, that they found as a result of performing that reconnaissance. So we wanna look at the lateral uh, type of category of detections. And I, 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 could, I should have highlighted that earlier, but, but you'll see that there's kind of a, a tag associated with each one of these different types of detections. So some types of detections fall within the reconnaissance category. Um, we've got lateral detections in this case, there's only one, which is this privilege anomaly, unusual host. Um, just for some background, um, the, the method by which we determine these privilege anomalies is through um, unsupervised learning methods. And those are, so, so the findings for these types of detections are unique to a given environment in which we're deployed. Um, when I say unsupervised learning, uh, these algorithms actually take in information that they're seeing that is uh, unique to each one of these environments and starts to build models of privilege uh, through doing graph analysis and then clustering models together of understanding relationships of hosts interacting with other hosts, user accounts interacting with those hosts, and the services that those user accounts may interface with, provided we're getting the input from something like either observing Kerberos traffic, um, ingesting Windows event security logs and, and Active Directory, things of that nature to feed those specific algorithms. This is not something that uh, raw packet headers alone can provide, but if we enrich that information around the relationship and the uh, the interaction from a host to host perspective, this is something that is really powerful when you layer it in. So we can see that uh, all of a sudden this this other administrative account, um, we saw that the uh, the H uh, Flax account didn't have the uh, the privilege to access the files in question, but all of a sudden we're seeing a very high privileged account um, from this host, and we're saying it's unusual that this account is operating on this host and that it's being granted to this list of services. So, um, you know, taking a step beyond just saying, hey, this is different. Um, so you can level set and kind of contextually understand, well, normally we're seeing a service account interact with it, um, a very specific uh, explicitly named uh, administrative account, and then a maintenance account. Um, so what did we want to find out here? So look, uh, which privilege account did the attackers manage to compromise and what is the privilege level of that account? And so the, the format in which we're going to respond to this. Um, Oh, the RPC summary has the total call. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm going to, again, I'm going to, I'll, I'll fall on my sword that I wasn't even paying attention and that it's just kind of more focused on <laughs> everything they've been doing the last couple of days. So I appreciate that's phenomenal, actually, and I didn't need to write anything down. So that's a good tip. Um, Paul gets extra points for pointing that out. So uh, which of these accounts do we see the K Malone administrator account? <sighs> which I don't want to copy all of, I just want to copy, you know, copy like this. And the privilege that we're asserting it has, and, and when I say privilege, um, think over time, as, as I mentioned, we're observing the interactions to ultimately funnel up to a one-to-many uh, relationship as having the highest amount of privilege, meaning, you know, there's a host, there's an account, there is a service that has the ability to interact with the broadest amount of other systems observed within the environment. That is, is effectively how we are asserting higher privilege. You can also always manually mark critical assets, critical accounts within your environment. You might have seen stars by some of the, uh, the assets in the environment. Um, whether it be a host or an account. And then um, 
so basically meaning these are key assets and, and regardless of the criticality of the detections associated with them, I always wanna have them front and center to me when I log, <clears throat> excuse me, when I log into that dashboard. Um, coming later this year, we're also in introducing the ability to further attenuate um, on the basis of either groups of IPs or hosts, groups of user accounts pulled from Active Directory groups as an example, um, subnets, entire networks, et cetera. Uh, and basically say, you know, for these that I, uh, for, for these subsections of my environment, we, we don't, we don't, we don't change uh, the intensity with which we interrogate the data associated with those systems. Uh, but what we do is we then dampen the scoring or augment the scoring, depending on the criticality that you tell us uh, those resources have. So as an example, if maybe you maintain a guest Wi-Fi network, um, you, you may care about what's going on on that guest Wi-Fi network, but unless you know you start to see bleed over from the guest Wi-Fi network into the enterprise network, um, you don't necessarily want to have you know something on the guest Wi-Fi network blazing in the critical quadrant. So you might uh, tamp down on on the the amount of scoring. Again, it doesn't remove uh, any of the interrogation of the data to provide the detections. It just it just mutes the scoring, um, and that's a capability coming uh, later this summer. So bigger fish to fry too. Um, so we're using this KRB KRBTGT uh, service. Uh, and based on the, uh, the behavior observed in the network, uh, it's typically normal for which account. Um, and so I think I'd already kind of shown, you know, which of these accounts we're normally seeing interacting with this particular service. I'll just, I picked the bottom one there. So now we know that the attackers not only made their way into the network, uh, they've now pivoted from uh, the account that they were using to a, a more privileged account. Um, and they've got access to even more confidential resources. And remember at the beginning of the exercise, we had one hour to prepare ourselves to go and brief uh, the CISO um, as to what occurred and you know, what, is, what, are, what are our planned next steps? How did this occur within the environment? So the sequence of activities uh, indicates that additional reconnaissance was, was performed now with this elevated privilege, um, probably so that they can see, you know, hey, now that I've got this greater privilege within the environment, are there juicier things that I can go after? So we can see, if I pivot back to this host, that they perform this file share enumeration. And that was where I was saying earlier, um, you know, we can, we can list out all of the different shares that we're seeing. Um, which of the accounts kicked that off on which systems. Um, so we have, a, we have a pretty good amount of detail. Um, like I said, hopefully there's, there's time at the end of the blue team exercise and I can actually show you even more granularly within the metadata um, that we can drill all the way down into the, the file names um, you know, that people are touching uh, when they're performing these types, of, uh, these types of attack campaigns. So what is it that the challenge wants us to show? Which IP, which host slash IP had the most number of shares enumerated and how many shares were enumerated in total? So we want the IP address and how many shares were enumerated in total? So let's see. This is where we need to scroll. So uh, I'll start back up at the top. Uh, so last octet 134, we see there's 13 shares enumerated. Uh, last octet 182, five shares, so 13, five, 147, five, 191, five, 155, five, 103, five, 122, five, 119, five, one six seven five, one five three five, uh, one two nine five, one zero oh, five five, <laughs> one one nine five, uh, two nine fourteen, which I believe the the most recent highest number was thirteen. So I'm going to copy this just for the time being while we continue to scroll. Uh, eleven five seven five. Okay, so I think 14 is the largest number. 
So, yeah, okay. So they've now enumerated the file pairs spanning a, a, a number of different systems within the environment. So now what they're most likely gonna do is package this all up and rather than try and expel all of this data from all of the systems where it resides, collect it into kind of a single point to then funnel it out. Um, we'll we'll kind of get to some, some of what it is, you know, how, how they might do that and, and some different approaches that they might take to do it. Um, so they've gained access to a lot of critical file shares. Um, uh, if you'll recall at the beginning of the briefing, it was it was understood or thought to, it was believed to be about a half a gig's worth of data um, that was uh, exfiltrated and post on the website. Uh, your digital loss prevention tool should have blocked it. Um, they're definitely, you know, CISO wants to know how was it that they managed to bypass uh, the tooling that we had in place. So if we look at the detections in the exfil phase and see how it was that they managed to um, send this data out. And let's look first. So, so data gathering, as I mentioned, you know, where we're, we're actually pulling all of the data all together. So even though ultimately they only exfiltrated uh, 500 uh, megabytes of data, they actually gathered uh, just over four and a half gigs worth of data. So performing data gathering, um, actually sent <laughs> more than uh, the believed 500 megs. They sent close to the entire amount of data. Uh, they staged it on this 10.10.30.7 uh, .10 host. They staged the, the 4.8 gigs of data there. Um, and then ultimately uh, sent out, as I said, just, just about all of it. Um, let's see. To review the detections in the exfil phase. So we're looking now at the data smuggler detection. So we see the amount gathered, the amount sent. We can see where they posted the data. We already kind of knew the, uh, the, the leak domain. We can see the amount sent there. Apparently, we, our organization was normally sending uh, just under 100 megabytes of data to a website called corporatelease.com, which is a conversation in and of itself. But um, you know, again, showing the difference between what we're normally sending and uh, you know what what we're sending in this case, and um, you know the means by which we we actually exfiltrated the data. Um, we can get stats on this domain, its reputation score, et cetera. So I believe. What we're looking for here is that we're leveraging a hidden HTTPS tunnel, uh, kind of the same means by which they entered the environment. They actually used to exfiltrate the data, and it's not unusual for, um, I, if you noticed, uh, yeah, that that we were we were basically it, it's not unusual to abuse um, you know different ports and protocols that have legitimate purposes. Um, and then leak data out uh, through those mechanisms. So let's see. Um, the data posted on the leak site. Um, so there we go. There's there's the discrepancy for you. So they chose, and it's not unusual, like to post a subset of the data collected to basically let you as the uh, stakeholder know that yeah, you got owned, um, we have data. <laughs> Here's just a taste of what we have, you know, if, if they're trying to, you know, hold you over a barrel essentially and, and basically extort you for more money. Um, you know, we know now that they have a lot more um, of the data than, than what's already been shared. Um, so let's look at the detection of the Excel phase and find out exactly how much data, which I'm sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit, um, but we can, this is, this is what we're asking that we saw, excuse me, in the data smuggler detection for how much data was collected and how much was ultimately infiltrated. So uh, 4.8 gigabytes uh, was how much we collected. I'll, I'll pivot back just so that uh, that everybody can see uh, what I was talking about there. So the again, we can we can see even see it here in, in how much data was sent. But if I go back to the data smuggler detection, we gathered or, or they gathered 4.8 gigs worth of data prior to the exfiltration event. Uh, and then ultimately sent out um, just under that amount. So 4.8 gigs, 4.7 gigs. 
and we're actually moving at a pretty good clip here so we'll have time to move into the the other environment but now we have the ability to actually get the full analysis um, of the report so i'll download that and this is the flow chart of what basically the the mapping that the the attackers used um you know the steps that they took they performed corporate roasting um those were the uh the suspicious LDAP queries and everything uh, and RPC reconnaissance to look for that privileged account, uh, escalated privilege uh, to then perform additional reconnaissance and then ultimately uh, sent data out uh, through that hidden uh, HTTPS tunnel, hidden, D sorry, hidden DNS tunnel. Um, and then there's just a full, you know, mapping of like putting this together for the CISO for her to see all of the systems that played a part in the campaign, as well as the different uh, the different stages of the attack that they took. Um, and so, if you're if you're working along with this at home, you, you'd actually be able to download this artifact. Um, this is something. All of the you you can schedule reports from within the Vectra tool to send you know summary reports to you know the interested parties around how many systems we're monitoring of those systems, how many have moved quadrants over the last week, month, et cetera, um, the details associated with those systems. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll complete the blue team here, blue team rocks. And we did it. And with that, so I'm gonna pivot actually from, you know, I, I, one, I wanna say thank you to everyone who sat with me as I worked through the challenges of this blue team workshop. This is, this is um, I would say, a beginner level workshop that we have. Um, we can, we, we actually offer this both to prospective customers and existing customers as a, as a, as a means of training. We can do it both in this um, kind of uh, walled uh, garden experience where we're really directing users, kind of moving them through the different phases. We also have the ability to do these types of blue, I mentioned earlier, blue, red team, and purple team workshops uh, with live environments, meaning we've actually got live vulnerable infrastructure that we can do this either in our cyber range um, or, you know, on somebody's network if they want to provide the infrastructure, um, you know, on a particular network segment, et cetera, um, and then load, you know, something like Kali instances or some, you know, basically something to use as a means of attacking that vulnerable infrastructure and observe the types of detections that Vector provides. And so we have pre-packaged blue, red, and purple team workshops. Um, this is, again, beginner level. Um, the intermediate ones actually have us pivoting into metadata. Um, which is what I'm going to show you now if people are okay with it. It, it won't take a long time and we will have the 15 minutes at the end uh, for questions. So I'm now in a, you may notice, you know, the, the environment we were, we were in earlier was looking at 20 IPs. Um, this, this is still, again, a demo environment in our cyber range, but we're looking at, you know, a significantly larger environment, just over 3,000 systems. Uh, the thing, again, I'd like to, to draw people's attention to, of those, you know, just under 3,300 systems, um, you know, we're really only putting about just over 1% of those systems at the forefront of somebody's attention. And even of that, only 10 hosts in the critical quadrant. But I, I wanted to show an example of um, the type of metadata. Let me see. Let me find a host with some uh, exfiltration. No, I don't want to do that. Um, so here, we, here we've got, um, you know, I, I mentioned before, our sensors can be deployed on premises in cloud. So here we actually have a server running in AWS. And uh, you all may notice, uh, I mentioned I like, uh, for whatever reason, my brain works better where I start at the top with what's going on and work my way to the bottom. Um, but we can see here that um, similar to the attack that we were just investigating, there's been file share enumeration on this particular system. And so we can look at that detection. We can expand all of these things. We can see, you know, similar to wh where we saw the number of shares enumerated across the different hosts. Um, but, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could actually look to see, you know, what data the attacker absconded with of you know this 2.5 gigs worth of data what uh 
what was actually in those payloads that they sent out. So looking, I don't want to, uh, yeah, here we go. So if I, so we have the ability, whether we're, yeah, I, I think I, I think I mentioned a couple of times architecturally. So we're, we're grabbing all of the network traffic. We're analyzing the metadata associated with that network traffic, but we can also output that metadata that we've been enriching um, as it's been interrogated by our algorithms, enriched by the additional data sources. And we can output that into a, a SIM or data lake, syslog server, et cetera. Um, we, we also have a platform called Recall, which uh, think of it as um, almost SIM as a service. So I can look at any of these, basically, using the detection as the tipper, examining all of the metadata surrounding the detection, because um, I think the detections and the UI that we build is really powerful. Um, honestly, the way in which we're um, instrumented at most of my customers anyway, is they are sending that metadata into some backend system. They're stitching together workflows that incorporate the information contained in the detections. Um, and then, you know, working with technology alliance partners to, to remediate based off of uh, what we're seeing. Um, I may I may be losing, uh, this, is the, this is the dreaded uh, live demo. You know, I, I got ahead of myself and wanted to show you something off script and now I'm, I'm suffering for it. Um, but I was looking at this earlier this afternoon. Oh, no, it's just slow to load. Um, I, I, my home network might be uh, oversubscribed because my kids might be watching Netflix or something. Um, so we were looking at DC2 AWS West 01. So this is the, the recall dashboard and we've got a bunch of different metadata that we're seeing um, associated with this system, internal RPC usage, RPC sessions over time, et cetera. But if I wanted to go and look at filter on this value. Uh, I'm not interested in metadata beacons, but I am interested in SMB files and my originating host name. Whoops. Uh, originating host name is this system. Oh, I want to remove that field. I can start to look at the originating host, the ports, the response hosts, the response ports. I can see the path that they opened, the shares that they opened, and I should be able to see. Ah, the name. Um, in this case, I'm seeing the name of the share, uh, but in the query that I was creating earlier, I was looking at the path of the data that was being extracted and ultimately drilling down all the way into the file names um, that somebody was touching. So I, just as a, as a quick example, there are 17 different metadata indices, and you can actually choose, we, uh, we put it back into detect here. Um, uh, metadata types, yeah, seven. So you, you, you can be selective in which metadata, you know, what metadata it is that you wanna choose. Um, and then if you're familiar with, um, there, there are a couple of really cool companies um, that have come on the scene that act as, um, I mean, they do far more than this. So I apologize if anybody is here from any of these companies, but, but companies like Cribble, which can take streams of data and they can further narrow down. In fact, they can perform any kind of translation you want on the data. Because like, as an example, just iSession alone, um, pretty intensive amount of data that gets piped out of iSession. You know, if I'm saying I want all the iSession data for everything that we're seeing. Um, but if there are only certain elements of that particular metadata type, you can use a transformation capability like, like a Cribble to basically sit between Vectra and a SIM or a Syslog or whatever it is, um, and, and more tailor um, the, the, those fields that are really important to you. So just, just as an idea as to how you can further instrument the data that, that Vectra provides. Um, I, uh, oh, I mentioned the, uh, that's resources. Just the, the additional connectors um, 
there's there's a there's a number of them that exist outside of the box but these are feeding those algorithms that i mentioned so we're instrumented against active directory um you know if we if, if we're in a highly virtualized environment pull information with vCenter i mentioned um the bi-directional relationship with sim um being able to do reverse dns lookup etc but uh, the reason that instrumenting those additional um, connectors is important is we, we we hang all of our detections, as, as you'll notice here, on these hosts and accounts. Um, and the host is more than the host name. It's more than its IP address. It's an aggregate construct of everything we understand to represent <laughs> excuse me, Con in this case, Conrad T480. Um, and that's important because, you know, it's not unusual for people to try and like spawn man in the middle attacks, suddenly espousing to be a type of server. Um, with this tool, with all of the integrations, it's really easy to see somebody who might be trying to masquerade as a legitimate system. Um, we get to do cool things where we've got EDR integrations that if you allow it, um, you know, basically us to call their API to isolate the host that's being protected by that API. Um, the last thing, if, if you're all, if you all are okay with it, that I'd like to just show as an example, I, I mentioned somebody made the comment earlier about you know the um, the IT glue, and I, I think I had mentioned you know from my perspective, uh, I really view that these days as as identity, um, you know, with with federated um, identity providers, you know, now we're, we've got that single sign on capability, but. Um, Again, that 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 now makes identity just this very very juicy target for attackers. So I'm not going to walk through all the different steps of of the the attack phases here. Uh, suffice to say, kind of similar to the exercise we just ran through, we've got an on-premises system um, that uh, fell fell afoul of uh, remote command and control, um, where they're you know. Hopefully the, the stages look pretty familiar at this point. You know, they're performing LDAP queries to find uh, squishier, uh, juicier credentials to escalate their privilege. Um, and in this case, um, you know, before in the example in the blue team workshop, we saw one of our privilege anomaly algorithms uh, showing that it was unusual for the account to be accessing a server, or sorry, a service. In this case, we're actually getting further triangulation where we're saying, you know, it's unusual. They, so by the way, just to shortcut it or, or by way of explanation, they found in another administrative account um, on a separate system that they also were able to access on the system where they had landed this SRV, SUP, Orion server. Um, but our detection immediately alerted to the fact that, well, it's really unusual for this account to be granted access to these services. Um, it's additionally unusual for this account to be operating on this host, not the other host. And it's unusual for this host to be using these services. Um, and again, just to compare and contrast to like where we normally see uh, the account for this service accessing it on this system uh, is a service account. So if we follow and pivot to the identity that we're, we're seeing um, basically generate the, uh, the activity associated with these detections, um, we, uh, let's see. Oh, my, uh, got a little bit out of whack there. Well, so they, um, they've got, they, they basically pivot from the gaining those credentials, they pivot into Azure AD. Um, and we see that uh, basically there's a couple of reasons that we flagged that. Um, we're, we've not noticed that IP before, as well as there's a concurrent session with, uh, you know, this, this user being logged in in a different environment. Um, and then they very quickly go and make changes to the Federation settings on their domain, which basically what they're wanting to do is open a backdoor for persistence for themselves. So they create a, uh, a suspicious uh, exchange transport rule um, that allows them to basically BCC themselves on any new account creation that occurs. Uh, and then they get to work on doing what it was that they wanted to do in the first place, which was to create an e-discovery search um, looking for any matches across SharePoint that contain the word source or code or patent. Uh, and then they use Power Automate, which is basically like PowerShell, but for the cloud on steroids. Um, and they basically call their e-discovery query uh, that is searching SharePoint uh, just continuously and exfiltrating that information out to Dropbox. 
Um, so I, I just, I, you know, appreciate everybody's patience. I, I wanted to kind of show you just some of the additional types of things that Vectra can detect on. And we have workshops, uh, blue team, red team, that cover all these different surfaces. So uh, in fact, um, if you're interested, we actually open sourced um, essentially APT29. Uh, you can look for it on GitHub. Um, it's called the Microsoft Azure AD Attack Framework. Um, and it's something that we maintain. You can go and inspect all the code. But the idea there being, you know, let's test and, and probe in, in real world scenarios, kind of like the, the use of uh, Bloodhound and Sharphound there in the, the Blue Team workshop. Let's, let's train with the types of tools that we're actually being attacked with so that we can validate that we've got the right tooling in place to detect these types of attacks and then take the appropriate countermeasures. Um, with that, I'm gonna end, the, that's, that's the conclusion of the Blue Team Plus. Um, and I, I welcome any conversation, questions, comments. Um, I do apologize. I mentioned I've got kids, they're, uh, they're younger uh, and they have a hard bedtime at 8 p.m. <laughs> uh, and I also have to get up at uh, you know 6 a.m. tomorrow morning to start to get them ready to go to school for me to go to Gartner. But um, I really appreciate everybody's time and would welcome some discussion and questions uh, you know, from now until the top of the hour. There is a question in the, in the chat. Okay, let me pull up the chat. Um, is it common to have this on Cali to basically keep all your tools together? Um, I, you know, honestly, um, uh, no, um, I mean, a, a, a real world attacker, what they are probably going to want to do is, um, you know, but I, you know what, I, I, I hate to say it, it's, it's an, it depends. Um, there was a recent vulnerability that just got publicized last week. Uh, apologize, let me go. It was a, um, it was a data transport tool um, that was used and they just released, uh, you know, some like a, 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 a basically zero day patch. Um, and move it. Talking. They move it, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, and one of the things, you know, if you think back to the exercise that we just did, where the data smuggler detection uh, showed, like, I think it's it's kind of a, I don't want to say it's a it's a naive approach, but um, I would say a more sophisticated adversary is going to try and spread out um, wh where they have tools available to them, vice kind of remaining. Uh, in a single landing zone, just because if they draw attention to themselves and lose access to that point of presence, then, you know, kind of the game is over for them, right? Unless they, you know, again, you, you saw it through some of the activities, um, you know, what they really want to do is establish a means of re-entering the environment. And so that's why I say it depends. Um, sometimes to take advantage of an unknown vulnerability, people don't bother to go and, um, you know, make it a more sophisticated type of attack because honestly, if they can leverage the breach, um, you know, they, they can get a ton of stuff uh, before people are able to take remediation action. Um, so there was a question, sorry, I'm scrolling back up through. Uh, oh, oh, and I apologize if I misunderstood the question. Yeah, and, and um, Ramfi uh, chimed in and I would say, yeah, you, you would, so like when we instrument um, in our cyber range, like one of these more like, I almost want to say hands off, but like basically put you in control of, we, we provide you with a Kali instance, it's on its own isolated VM. And then you've got vulnerable infrastructure separate of that Kali box that you can then use to attack. You, what, what you will often do is use Kali to instrument a number of implants on that vulnerable infrastructure that you're then, um, you know, Kali kind of becomes your command and control center unless you want to spawn a separate VM to interact with your C2 implants that you're putting into the, the vulnerability, or sorry, the vulnerable infrastructure. Um, uh, Tom asked, so is Vector intended to fully replace a seam or is it additional capability to augment seams? So I was having like this very conversation with a CISO at Gartner earlier today. Um, this is my view. Uh, this is not Vector's view. Uh, I still think there's a lot of value in SIM. I think tools like Vectra, um, 
can allow you to be more selective as to the information that you need to send into SIM and also the way in which you're interacting with SIM. Um, this is a, you know, Vectra presents a, a real-time threat detection capability. SIM by its very nature can do batch process querying. So it was never meant to be a real-time security tool. I think it kind of became de facto the security tool that people used because it was that centralized logging repository. So it had all the data. Uh, the trouble there is you have to know what it is that you want to find. Um, so if I need to go and find things that match certain CVEs or you know, previously known methods of compromise, that's great. I can reactively search through STEM all day long. Um, Vectra doesn't have any reliance on understanding that initial method of compromise. We're just looking at those, um, I, again, I call them like archetypal attacker behaviors. So you get the benefit of all of that metadata, which again, whether you send in full, in part, maybe even further uh, triage down via something, uh, you know, some kind of data translation layer that may sit in between us and a sim. Um, so again, I'm not speaking for Vector now, I'm speaking as, as my own opinion. I still think there is value in sim. I just think that Vector can help um, make more effective use of the sim. Um, uh, do we have training or internship programs? I believe Vectra does have internship programs. Um, I will do some looking and whatever I can find there, I will send to Carry and team. Um, for what it's worth, I, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a program that I participated with uh, back when I was at Nutanix and I've since used it also at Vectra. Uh, there is a program called SkillBridge, which is for people who are preparing to leave military service. Um, it is a internship-like program, but it's a joint effort between uh, DOD and industry. And um, I've actually uh, helped a few people, um, you know, kind of make that transition into the private sector as they as they left uh, their military career or, or kind of closed the door on their military career. Um, I, I don't know if we are still if Vector still has an active relationship with Skillbridge, but um, you know, I think that's something. I, I believe there are internship programs. I just don't know in which parts of the company. Um, I mean, we have, so I, you know, I run uh, our security engineering team, which is effectively a, a pre-sales engineering team. We're talking to prospective customers. We're helping to instrument uh, proof of value, uh, really understanding the requirements of customer environments. Um, but then we've got a, a consulting services team that really works hand in hand with us to implement these joint solutions with customers. Um, we have a managed detect and response capability. So think, um, you know, security analyst as a service, they're all vector trained analysts. And the cool thing about the customers that are able to avail themselves of that service is we've got vector analysts looking at the detections in vector, you know, from Vectra. Um, who are also sitting shoulder to shoulder with the people that are writing the code, the people that are doing the security research that helped build the algorithms, the data scientists that built the algorithms. Um, so I, I, from what I have heard, the people that are able to take advantage of this MDR, managed detect and response capability, um, it really does plus up. In some cases, if, if, if the, um, if the customer that instrumented Vectra just, you know, they, they have kind of a, they have an IT, uh, support staff, but maybe not a dedicated SOC. Um, question, do we have limited or unlimited access to this uh, to complete the other challenges? Um, I believe this environment should stay live. It should stay live through the end of this evening. Um, please reach out uh, to Carry and team if there is an interest in accessing this. Also, um, in the deck that'll get sent out, um, if you go to demo.vectra.ai, you can sign up for um, a live demo, which puts you into an environment very similar to the one that I'm in right here. So it has several guided tours, but you have the ability to click out of them and go, instead of you know, only being able to select certain parts of the interface, you'll be able to move through and, and investigate anything that you'd like. Um, what type of alert APIs do you support? Uh, mainly via webhooks, et cetera. Um, that's primarily it. Um, anything that you, any of the interactions or the data associated with the detections, um, we're able to basically get those and put them into systems. Uh, and similarly, we can query the backend metadata 
um, via a subset of those APIs to push that, you know, to push the um, the the corresponding metadata sections, um, you know, into into other tooling. Um, real quick, actually, that uh, as, as I was saying that um, something worth I think bringing up that I don't believe is uh, highlighted in the blue team, and I hope it's instrumented in this demo environment. But um, let me go back to Conrad T four eighty real quick. Um, now it's it's so we don't have it turned on because it is a demo environment. But um, so there's a number of things we 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 didn't even touch on. But like you can you can add notes to a particular detection so that if you're working with an analyst team, you can tag detections, you can triage things out, which I think I described in in part. But by default, um, you you can enable this PCAP capability. Um, that basically any time a detection fires, um, because we use a rolling buffer from the metadata sent from the sensor to the brain, we actually go back and create what I call a micro PCAP of the surrounding event that you can download for any of the detections and then throw into Wireshark. Um, when actually, when I was interviewing uh, for Vectra, uh, they said, well, we're gonna have you do a blue team and a red team workshop. And I was like, oh man, it's been a minute. Uh, I was thinking I was gonna have to download Metasploit or something like that, roll my own. Uh, attacker toolkit and see like, you know, am I going to be able to hack Vector basically, which it wasn't anything like that. We, um, you know, we similar to the uh, the cyber range that we would make available to you. Um, but the cool thing I noticed when I was when I was playing around with the environment was like, oh, I can actually grab all of the Wireshark or the PCAP data that I need, throw it into Wireshark and get a lot of additional information without necessarily pivoting all the way into, you know, a SIM or something like that to look at the associated metadata. Um, are there any other questions? Um, does the vector interface with threat intelligence platforms and enhance enhance indicators of compromise? Um, so, you know, as was briefly touched on in the in the blue team workshop itself, like we have the ability to ingest threat intelligence feeds. Um, similarly, you could take. I apologize. I'm 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 thinking. I don't want to give you a an incorrect answer. Um, I think because. I think it's possible. Um, it's not necessarily what I would say our, our primary play is. Um, I was having a conversation at the show today where um, I was talking with somebody that has multiple sites spread across the US and they were interested in taking the detections that they observed at their respective sites and correlating it to see you know, what, what fell in common across those different sites um, to basically say like, you know, hey, is there a type of baseline that we can establish? Or, you know, is there something that we're seeing in the majority of our sites that we ought to be alerting uh, the other portions of our enterprise to? So I think from that, let's see, like in order to threat hunt, pivot from something to something else. Um, Yeah, I, p p potentially, um, you know, I think so. So like, I, you know, just to harken back to the blue team exercise, you know, we uncovered uh, an offending external domain, external IP address. Like, I mean, this is a very reductive type of answer, but we could take that information and certainly tell other folks either, you know, in sister organizations or other parts of our organization, I mean, ideally they would have vector deployed so they could find it too. But even if they didn't, you could sit there and say, hey, you need to go and look to see if you've got, you know, historically, have you had any kind of uh, interaction with anything from these, you know, these types of domains, et cetera. So um, I think we can. Um, it just, it, it, I think it's a very good question. I think it's just, uh, it probably, probably requires a little bit more of a nuanced answer than just a, a, a blanket yes or no. Um, and I apologize, uh, uh, Diamond, um, there was some help uh, after the second step. Um, I, would, I would ask, you know, maybe reach out to um, 
to, to Carrie and Merle and team. And, and if, if it's something that you'd be interested in doing, we could certainly set up a, a separate session uh, to kind of walk you through. Um, I, sometimes it's challenging, depending on the type of browser that you're using and the fact, again, that you're that, that blue team workshop really has some some guardrails put around it. Um, it doesn't always play nice with uh, different browsers and things of that nature. So happy to try and, and, and help if we could. Ah, uh, Ramses. Okay, yeah. Um, and I apologize, Ramsey, if I'm uh, mispronouncing your name, but uh, no, I, I I take your meaning more, and you know, would welcome the opportunity to have um, you know a more specific targeted conversation in that area, or even you know dive deeper if you have interest in in what the tools capability represents. Um, you'll still have access to this environment for the duration of the evening. Um, I don't believe the I don't believe this session was recorded, um, but it was. there is. A, yes, you would all oh. get this. Yes. Oh, it is recorded. Okay, well, that's yes, now I've, I've probably embarrassed myself any number of times throughout the uh, presentation. Um. But that's okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. That's great. So good. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad it can be available. But um, we do also maintain a YouTube channel uh, and a Vimeo channel. So a lot of the same types of content and the approaches that we were discussing throughout the exercise this evening, um, there's there's that and and, and a host more. Um, I mean, there there are, are whole deep dives that go in far more granular detail around the data science, the security research approach, um, instrumentation uh, around hooking together you know, some of those tech alliance ecosystem partners that I had mentioned earlier. So yeah, please do take a look. If, if this was interesting to you, I, I definitely would urge people to go and take a look at the YouTube channel. The recording will be sent out to everyone. Thank you, bro. Uh, Tom asks, can you query logs that have not been ingested into your platform? So um, not so much. We can't query the logs that haven't been ingested into our platform. But what we can do is if there are network related, if there's network related information that didn't traverse one of our sensors, nor come in through, you know, one of the, um, you know, either an EDR integration or DNS, uh, et cetera, but was resident in a SIM that we had a, a connection to, we could actually ingest network related information and process that through the platform um that's it's kind of a i don't know if i'm answering the question properly because basically in order for us to look at information we have to have processed it through the algorithms interrogated it um at some point for for us to be able to make use of it awesome really appreciate yeah i really appreciate everyone's time and participation tonight um I, and 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 merle and team thank you so much for the opportunity for for myself and vectra to uh to participate with the group it's 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 a phenomenal organization thank you so much for taking the time out and, and showing us and, and letting uh the students get in and, and mess around with it on their own as well um with that we're going to stop recording and end the line like i said everything will be sent out to to, to the students who who sent us an email and, and registered so please look out that in a couple of days, maybe by the end of this week, beginning of next week. Don't forget to, <coughs> to get your CEs for this, right? It's been put out a few times. If y'all have any other questions, you know how to get in contact with Intellectual Point. Thanks again, Zach. We appreciate it. This is uh, awesome. Th thank you all so much. And uh, yeah, please, you know, reach out and uh, would, would hope hopefully we'll have the opportunity to interact in the future. Thank you all. Thank you.